When we think of serial killers, Charles Manson, Jeffrey Dahmer, Ted Bundy are some of the names that come to mind. But a lot of people don't know that one of the world's most notorious killers is actually a lot closer to home. He wasn't just a serial killer, he was a scam artist, a jewel thief and a fraudster. This is the story of Charles Sobraj, the serpent, the bikini killer. But see, Sobraj wasn't just your typical serial killer. He wasn't violent and he didn't like the bloodlust. Sobraj murdered as a way of travelling through continents, which is by far one of the strangest motives I've ever heard of. He used his good looks and undoubtable charm to befriend those he met on his travels. He lured them in, drugged them, and after having killed them, stole their identities and moved from country to country under false pretense. And his story is one of the wildest I've ever heard in a very, very long time. So, strap right in. Achand Bonani Gurumukh Charles Sobraj was born in Saigon and is believed to have killed at least 12 people, with some reports doubling that number. These were mostly around Southeast Asia in the 70s and the 80s. He spent his childhood shuffling between Asia and France and first found himself in jail at the age of 19 in 1963, convicted of burglary. This is important because when he went to prison, he met a wealthy prison volunteer named Felix Descogni. He moved in with Felix upon his release. Yeah. Dude went to prison and came out with a rich roommate. And this is just the tip of the iceberg of what Sobraj's wits would win him in life. With Felix's connections, Sobraj began to play both worlds, moving seamlessly between the criminal underworld of Paris and the city's high society. One report called him a social class chameleon. And here is where Sobraj's charms really shine. In 1970, Sobraj married a young Parisian woman named Chantal Compagnon. He and a pregnant Chantal travelled to Asia. It was here that Sobraj indulged in some petty crime to pay their way, robbing tourists and travelling on stolen passports under false identities. Once he was in Asia, he started expanding his criminal portfolio with stealing cars, smuggling and even armed robbery. His dealings with the criminal underworld in Paris and his further crimes in Asia made Sobraj no stranger to the inside of a jail cell. In 19 in 1973, Sobraj was arrested after an unsuccessful armed robbery attempt on a jewellery store in Hotel Ashoka. He escaped along with Chantal and fled to Kabul, where, surprise, surprise, he was arrested once again. For most people, that would be the end of his budding criminal career, but not for Sobraj. He used various feigned illnesses in order to be taken to a hospital just like he did in Asia. He would claim that he has appendicitis or he would even try to vomit fake blood. But these were run of the mill tricks. Some of his escapes are actually very difficult to believe. In Kabul, Sobraj drugged the guard minding his room and simply walked out of the hospital. See, he had this uncanny ability to make anyone around him trust him implicitly, even guards. During this time, Chantal parted ways with Sobraj and eventually made it back to her family in Paris. He then spent a few years on the run, traveling through Eastern Europe and the Middle East, this time aided by his half-brother, Andre. The brothers were caught and arrested in Athens, but again, this was a small hitch for Sobraj. He switched identities with his brother, escaped and left Andre in a jail cell. Around 1975, Sobraj committed his first murder. He did this with a man he met along the way named Ajay Chaudhary. Their first victim was Teresa Knowlton, a backpacker from Seattle. She was found in a tidal pool in the Gulf of Thailand. Drum. This crime was the first of many that gave Sobraj one of his most infamous nicknames. Nolten was wearing a bikini and so the legend of the bikini killer began. Chaudhary wasn't the only accomplice that Sobraj acquired along his long murderous career. Sobraj acquired followers by gaining their loyalty through his wit and charm, much like most cult leaders. See, the easy way to do this is to present a solution to a target for a very difficult situation. In one case, he helped two former French policemen recover missing passports, ones that Sobraj himself Self had stolen. In another instance, Sobraj provided shelter to a Frenchman who appeared to be suffering from dysentery. Sobraj had actually poisoned him himself. While in Thailand, Sobraj was just going about his life, you know, posing as a drug dealer and a jewel salesman, when he started seeing a French Canadian traveler called Marie Andre Leclerc, who became his most devoted accomplice. Remember that charm I kept going on and on about? Well, Sobraj didn't only use it on his victims. He also used it to amass a Charles Manson-like, well, not exactly to that degree, but yeah, cult of followers who aided him in his killings. The next victim was a traveller named Vitali Hakim, whose burnt body was found near the resort where Sobraj and Leclerc were living. Soon after, 
two Dutch students followed, their bodies found strangled and burnt as well. A while later, the remains of Shamien Karu, Hakim's girlfriend, was found. She had travelled to Thailand to find him after she wasn't able to get in touch with him. After their slew of murders, and presumably because it was getting too hot to stay in Thailand, Sobraj and Leclerc then absconded to Nepal, where they continued their reign of terror. They met and murdered a pair of North American backpackers and travelled into India. As Sobraj had done numerous times before, they used their previous victims' identities through their stolen passports and returned to Thailand. Sobraj, Leclerc, and now reunited with Chaudhary, travelled together to Singapore and then later to India, where they killed Israeli tourist Alan Aaron Jacobs, again just to take his passport. Mind you, all of this happened within a year, and man was it a busy year for them. In the spring of 1976, they returned to Bangkok, but keep in mind, the authorities were still on the lookout for Sobraj. Now I know what you're thinking. How can there not be some people who thought that they were at least a little suspicious? I mean, they've killed a bunch of people by now, so yeah. well. You're right, there were a bunch of people who were hella suspicious and they informed the authorities. Sobraj was apprehended, but after being interrogated by the cops, he was just released. It's also assumed that the Thai authorities were worried about the negative effects that a trial about murdered tourists would have on tourism. The trio soon left Thailand and settled in Malaysia, and that was the last anyone saw of Chaudhary. It's believed that Sobraj had killed Chaudhary because he was getting paranoid about their past crimes being uncovered. Leclerc, ever loyal, continued her journey with Sobraj through Switzerland and then to India, where they posed as jewel traders. After killing another victim in Bombay, Sobraj finally got caught in Delhi. They were caught because of the sheer ambitiousness and grandiose of their latest scheme. They attempted to trick around 60 French postgraduates students into taking anti-dysentery medication so that they could rob them blind while they were under sedatives. But Sobraj miscalculated the doses so some of them were affected earlier than others. They were violently ill and so they realized that their new friend was behind all of this. They subdued him and they called the cops. He was then detained in Tehar jail in Delhi. He, like most charismatic serial killers, turned his trial into a media circus. He went on a hunger strike, hired and fired his legal team at will, and made sure the media ate up every minute of it. He was finally sentenced to 12 years for attempted robbery. Leclerc was also found guilty of drugging the French students, and reports state that she later returned to Canada on parole after being diagnosed with cancer. But well, we've seen how Charles's charm can make even the worst situations better for him. In every situation that I've been, even in the worst situation, I have always, instead of the situation controlling me, I have always succeeded to control the situation. Because in manipulating, you may say, uh, the people with whom I was dealing. And as I always say, as long as I have to deal with people, I can always get out. He bribed the police officers with stolen gemstones he had and basically made sure that he, even while imprisoned, lived a lavish life. He had the luxury of his own television set and dined on the finest of foods. His interpersonal skill of getting anybody to like and trust him was a great asset in jail. After 10 long but still pretty good years in jail, Sobraj now faced a problem. While incarcerated, his past murders came back to haunt him. See, the investigations into the murders he committed in Thailand never really stopped. A particular thorn in his side was a Dutch diplomat, Herman Nippenberg, who was trying to uncover what happened to those two Dutch students from 1975. He finally got Sobraj's scent on the trail and he raided his then residence. He uncovered crucial evidence in the form of a number of passports and driving licenses, which is one of the first indications that Sobraj had many, many more victims than was previously known. Sobraj was now in a massive fix. He had influence, a great life, and luxuries here in India, but the evidence was stacked against, and if he were to be extradited to Thailand, he'd most likely be put to death. And so, he pulled off the most impressive feat of his psychopathic career. With just two years left on his sentence, he threw a party in his New Delhi jail for officers and inmates. Yeah, you heard that right. The inmate threw a party for the other inmates and the guards. That's the level of influence Sobraj was so afraid of losing. In true Sobraj fashion, he somehow managed to drug all the partygoers with sleeping pills and literally just walked 
out of prison. After escaping, he made no attempts to flee and he just hid in plain sight. He was quickly caught in a restaurant in Goa. He was sentenced to 10 more years, which was actually the plan all along. See, this would mean his release would be in 1997. And so the 20-year arrest warrant issued by the Thai authorities would reach its statute of limitations and expire. He couldn't be charged for any of the crimes he committed in Thailand. And so Sobraj continued his fine living in the Indian prison system. Upon release, Sobraj returned to the familiar and moved back to Paris. Since his arrest, crimes and trial was so public, he became a sort of quasi-celebrity there. But well, he decided that this wasn't enough for him and so he slipped back onto the old beaten path. In 2003, he travelled to Nepal where on the streets of Kathmandu, he was recognised and arrested for the murders of the two North American backpackers from 1975. He was tried and this time he got a life sentence where he is still incarcerated. Reports claim that in 2008, Sobraj announced his engagement to a Nepali woman, Nihita Biswas. Sobraj married her on 9th October 2008 in jail. The life and violent ways of Sobraj is one of the most interesting glimpses into the mind of a serial killer, of what charm, deceit and a silver tongue can get you. The accounts of this video are just a few of his victims and a fairly condensed version of his life story. Till date, Sobraj still feels like he didn't really do anything wrong. He once said, I can justify the murders to myself. I never killed good people. Did you enjoy this video? Well, if you did, fear not, there's a lot more to come. We're doing an entire series on the lives and minds of serial killers. Tell us which ones you'd like us to cover in the comments. Hey guys, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. The kinds of videos we want to make are to ask fun and compelling questions, explore weird and intriguing stories and delve into secret histories. So if that's something you're interested in, this is the channel for you. Don't forget to tell us what you like in the comments.